Depression is a genetic disorder. What do I mean by that? Depression runs more reliably as you look at closer and closer relatives, and you eventually look at identical twins, and if one of them has depression, the other has a 50% <coughs> chance. So this is where we run into problems with data analysis and statistical analysis. Indeed, you might have a 50% chance and a much higher likelihood of also developing depressive states later on in life. Is that wholly because of genetics? We can't really track that down to the one ACTG bit of the DNA strand that's that's paralleling there. You could also develop depression because you are living in the same family that caused the depression as well, or created this state of learned helplessness, just like your twin did. This is not about, ooh, genes control our brains and genes control our behavior. This is a gene that is relevant to how readily we pick ourselves up after life has dumped us on our rear ends, how readily we recover from stressors. Okay, so that's extremely dangerous to describe to a patient. Like, what I'm realizing as I write this book, Diagnostic Default, all of this needs to be kept behind closed doors because once you start telling a patient that their genetics can set them up for a 30x likelihood for not being able to pull themselves out of the trenches really dangerous and it doesn't take that like i have people that i work with that describe them just just make this on an assumption that they have a genetic default or they have a genetic predisposition towards this in combination with the random words that they've heard in psychological lingo that circle around ace scores they say i've had this adverse childhood experience and i had this one and this one and I also could have this genetic disposition. And so that means I'm for sure limited in this capacity. I can never pull myself out of these states. So it doesn't take much for people to victimize themselves is what I'm realizing. And that's really unfortunate. And when I say that, it starts to sound ableist and it sounds intolerant or whatever. This whole like anti-psychiatry, anti-psychology narrative. I'm also not trying to fall into that category because we need psychology. We need better neuroendocrinology, we need better psychiatry and psychology. And this is how we get it, is having these open discuss discussions. This could be called a generalist perspective, this could be called a philosophical perspective on the matter. Whereas what we're looking at is deterministic narratives, and these are also supported in the culture. So we also teach children to think reductively, think in these categorical labeling ways of reasoning. And it's it's so deep seated in, in the Western paradigm that it's it's in the English language. Seventy percent of our words in the English language are nouns; they are labels for things, as opposed to other other rates in other countries that are much lower, especially the Eastern countries. So I'll try not to go on a rant here, but what we seem to be encouraging in the United States is this either incredible bigotry, incredible intolerance, and uh, hustle culture or grind culture. And if you're not always pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps, if you're not always checking yourself before you wreck yourself and all that, then you're you're making yourself into a victim, and then and, and you're you're woke like that's the anti woke crowd from the right, and then you have the anti fascist, anti ableist crowd coming from the left saying that I need all the accommodations, I need all of my woes validated, and any of the scientific data, all of the categorical, deterministic, atomistic, and reductive approaches that can be taken to describe my condition, I'll latch onto those. And the university is in its seventh generation of reasoning this way, I, I would say. This whole idea of, of pursuing the monomath lens as opposed to the polymath, pursuing the, the PhD that is a specialty in a field that only hones a particular lens, and then that lens provides an entire diagnostic Lebensbelt of labels. They have 640 diagnostic labels to ascribe to and all of the criteria that underlies all of that. So if you want to make yourself into a victim, if you want to view yourself through this deterministic lens, it's it's both gratifying, it's narrative constructing, it, it helps us find a, a comfortable la narrative for ourselves, and it also allows us to take the path of least resistance. And this is where the brain's avoidance of cognitive dissonance and combinatorial explosion, as it's called in, in cognitive science, where there's too many combinations of factors, it's, it's easier not to consider all these other complexities, consider the perspectives and consider the procedures and the processes that might yield betterment when I can instead latch on to this entire narrative full of words that allow me to not 
work on myself and not overcome my depression, not take on the various tools and try the, the many, many infinite methods because you can never try enough methods. You can never, you can go your whole life and try all the different frameworks and never have tried them all. And so that starts to sound like ableism as well. And that starts to sound in insensitive. So we're kind of in this paradigm where it's like the us versus them mentalities. And I know I'm going to get thrown into one of these boats by uploading this video here. So I, I really hope that I've described this with as much nuance and clarity as possible. And I know I haven't, <laughs> so I, I know I could do better in this regard, but I, I appreciate your patience. And again, I want to state, Robert Sapolsky is a hero of mine. This is a man that instilled my interest in science almost a decade ago with his Stanford lectures. And it's, he's a brilliant mind, and I've, I've read many of his books, and he's very influenced, very much influenced my thinking. And now I'm at the stage in my studies where I'm starting to find the utility in questioning the deterministic paradigm and questioning when I see determinism and when it could influence people to live a lesser life, when it could limit their lives. And this seems to be very, very much the case in a lot of deterministic reasoning. So yes, I hope I've made sense here. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Please uh, share this video if you feel it's been valuable. If you have loved ones that you believe are indeed in the diagnostic default, if they're in this deterministic default, if you want to call it that, and please feel free to share that. That helps the YouTube algorithm let people know that this discussion is being had. Anyways, thanks so much for watching Polymaths. I'll see you in the next one.